I'd like to explain option delta. Option delta tells us how much we expect the value of the option to change in response to a change in the underlying stock price. So in my example here, the call option delta is 0 0.61, 0 0.61, and that just means that if the stock price changes by positive $1, then we would expect the call price to increase by 61 cents. As usual, I start here in the lower right with the inputs. These are the assumptions that go into my Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model. There are six. I'm only showing five of the six because the stock price input assumption, which is important, is the x-axis on my graph. Both of these graphs share the same x-axis, and that's the stock price after all. Dynamically over time, the stock price moves. So we can think of it as shifting to the right or left. That's volatility in the stock price. And this is going to be a call option, that's the derivative, on an underlying stock. This stock is not paying any dividends, so we say it's a non-dividend paying stock. And I'm using a round number here, a nice round number for the strike price, also called the exercise price on this call option. You can see it's $100. Volatility refers to the volatility of the underlying stock price. We have a risk create of 4% and also a round number for the option term. So this is a one-year call option on a non-dividend paying stock where we're assuming that stock has a volatility of 30% per annum. And so in the upper left, I have a graph here that's in virtually any textbook that introduces option pricing. It's a graph that shows on the y-axis the value of the call option for corresponding values on the x-axis of the stock price. So you can see here at $100, that would be $100, and that would be an at-the-money call option because the stock price would equal the strike price. It's neither above water nor underwater, has zero intrinsic value. On that y-axis, I'm calling that call option value, so that's the value of the option according to the Black-Scholes-Merton, so we could also call it the theoretical price of the option. So we could use value or price synonymously, although in this case I preferred value because if we say price, it sort of begs the question, do we mean the traded price that we observe or do we mean the theoretical price according to a model? So I'm just using value to avoid that. So call option value. And again, here on the x-axis we have stock price going higher or lower, and over time that would fluctuate, but the strike price would not change. And so for this given stock price of 100, as the stock price increases, then this option becomes, we say, in the money, right? Stock price exceeds the strike price. As the stock price were to drop below the strike price, then we would be out of the money, so OTM. Out of the money, I like to say underwater, above water, same difference here. So here's something interesting, or we could say this, the value of this call option, and I'm denoting that with a small c. Hard to tell that that's a small c as opposed to capital C. Small c denotes European call option. It's necessarily true that its value needs to be the intrinsic value plus the time value. And in terms of this relationship here, when the stock price in this case is $100 or lower, so this segment of the line, this left-hand side of the line, so to speak, for all of these points, this call option is out of the money or underwater, and hopefully you'll agree with me, zero intrinsic value. Intrinsic value means what the value of the option if we were to exercise it immediately. If the stock price is lower than the strike price, this is, we would have, we would get zero. This is zero intrinsic value. That means that for all, for this segment, all of these values are only time value. Now, as we go up here to the right, these values do have intrinsic value. So they're a mix of intrinsic value and time value. But we typically compute the time value, which is harder to infer directly by taking the call value and subtracting the intrinsic value, which is very easy to observe. Okay, so what's a key feature of this line? A key feature is that it is nonlinear. It has curvature. 
In option, in the option world, we're going to call that gamma, and it's directly analogous to what we call in the bond world convexity. So you can call it curvature as well. And so this price, call option to stock price, nonlinear. Now I'll take this point at the money where the stock is $100, and we'll just imagine that it is now a point of tangency such that we can draw a straight line. That's a tangent line at this point. Of course, there's a different tangent line for every point on here. I happen to be the, trying to draw the one for the at the money call option. The slope of this line is the delta, and that's the lower left plot. Here you can see call option delta versus stock price. So for an at the money option, when the stock is 100, you'll notice my Black Scholes Merton tells me that the value of a call option, this one year call option, when the volatility is 30%, it's so all dependent on that, the call option has a value of $13.75, and the slope of that tangent line at that point, going straight down here, I've also colored that in, is the delta. So here, we're plotting the slope of that line, if you could just imagine moving like that. And it happens to be very close to 0.6, it happened to be exactly 0.612. And if you know calculus, then you know that as the slope of that tangent line, that's all. this is also the first derivative. So delta, which we typically denote with the Greek delta, is we could, calculus-wise, we could say it's the partial derivative or change in the call price with respect to an instantaneous change in the stock price. Or we can just abbreviate in discrete form and say it's the change in the call price associated with a change in the underlying stock price. So it's one of the most important risk factors in the value of this option, driving the value of the option up or down, option delta, along with Vega and some of the other Greeks. This graph here plots this delta as the stock price varies. So this also would be in any any uh, finance textbook that introduces the concept of delta, very common to see this S-type shape. You can see this is nonlinear. Key, a key feature is the bounds of this option delta, right? So you can see here we're, we're right at the middle for the at the money. And as a gut check, an at the money option, well, that delta will vary, right? It varies based on term and volatility primarily. But we do expect for the call option for the delta to be at about 0.5 to 0.6. So we're in the neighborhood. You'll notice here now, as I move to the left, as we imagine the stock price decreasing, of course, you can see that the slope of the tangent line is decreasing. So hopefully that's intuitive that the slope of this tangent line is decreasing as we move to the left, such that we're getting over here to very low stock prices where we are deeply out of the money on the call option and the delta consequently is approaching zero. So I'm going to use interval notation. I'm going to use instead of a square bracket, which uh, suggests um, inclusive, I'm going to use exclusive to suggest we never quite get there, right? The lower bound is zero on this per that flat line. And if you think about it, this actually is intuitive. As the option is deeply in the money, its value is not very responsive to the stock price. Think about it. If you're very much underwater, move into the stock price don't help you. They just make you a little bit less underwater. On the other hand, as we move to the right, stock price increasing. Now this option is in the money and it's becoming deeply in the money. And then where what is happening to the slope of this line? It's not getting vertical. It's getting approaching a 45 degree angle, meaning one for one. If you think about it, that's also intuitive. As we get here into a deeply in the money, the option has a lot of intrinsic value, and there's an almost one for one correspondence. If the stock price jumps by $1, the option value basically inherits almost all of that intrinsic value, and its value increases $1 as well. So we're approaching here a one, and that's the upper bound here. So I would just ask you to be a uh, notice for the call option delta. This y, this y axis, the bounds of this are a significant feature of call option delta, bounded by zero on the left and bounded on by 1.0 on the right. I'm going to use again exclusive interval notation. And so that's my call option delta. How should we interpret the call option delta? Well, 
We'll ask you to notice that as this first partial derivative, we're dividing a, 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 an option value that's in dollars by a stock price that's in dollars. The dollars cancel. It's a unitless. That's right. Option delta is unitless. So I'm going to just stay with my at the money call option. We interpret the 0.61 as the following. If the, I'm going to say, change in the stock price is plus one dollar, I'll put a dollar sign there. If the stock price changes one dollar, an option delta of 0.61, I'm going to round down, tells us to expect that the call price change will equal 61 cents. See how simple that is? Here's a, a common misconception, so common that it's actually misstated in the current assignment for the FRM on this topic. A common misconception is to treat this a little bit like uh, duration on the bonds and assume it's a percentage. To take this a dollar change, convert that uh, and express that as a percentage, and assume that the 61 is is a uh, 0.61% or 61 basis points for every one point percentage point in change in the stock price. That's not what the delta is. It's unitless. So it's actually simpler than that. It's uh, 0.61 dollars for every unit change in the stock price. And the unit in this case is $1. So it's very simple. It's telling us if the stock price, for example, were to increase by $2, then we are expecting a change in the call price of 0.61 multiplied by $2. See, it's a straight multiplier being unitless. And so we would get $1.22. Unitless, it's a simpler than it would be if we misinterpreted it as a percentage. However, keep in mind, it's a first partial derivative. So this, it's the slope of this tangent. When we say the stock price is changing by $2, we're estimating the change as a function of the line, which approximates here the actual price relationship, which is nonlinear. So, and this line, you can see it has a gap. We know it's inaccurate. It's a first partial derivative. We know using delta this way to estimate the change in the call price is inaccurate. In this case, we'll like underestimate the value, or it depends on how you express the gap. But we know it's inaccurate because the actual relationship is nonlinear and we're relying on a linear approximation. Okay, I'll show you the put next. Oh, but real quick, I just forgot. The one other way to express that uh, delta is a share equivalent. So that calculation for delta, and this is in my spreadsheet, for the call option is N of D1. And we do need to haircut it with the dividend yield. That's typical haircutting and option pricing. That's our delta. If I now plug that into the black shoals, I end up with stock price times delta minus the strike price reduced by the risk-free rate. That's discounted cash multiplied by my other probability function. That's the standard normal cumulative distribution function. I'm calling these probability functions for short. There, what I have is a version of the Black-Scholes where I'm just ex explicating the delta. That's our option delta right there. And so we call we can call this uh, delta shares. What I mean is that if this, re this represents a synthetic portfolio where we go long or purchase delta number of shares, and at the same time we borrow this amount of dollars, we have a synthetic portfolio that economically matches the call, a call option, the, the payoff of a call option, if we rebalance it dynamically. And therefore, this represents the price of the call option. And that is an insight into actually how the Black-Scholes-Merton works. But I just wanted to say that, that is, uh, this delta is also known as delta shares or delta share equivalents. And if I go to the put option, it's very much the same. In this case, pricing the put where the at the money put under my assumptions happens to be worth only $6. It's worth less. That's typical. And the associated delta, which as you know by now, represents the slope of this tangent line. And, and obviously that this slope is negative. And so delta of the put is necessarily negative. You can see at the money here, it's negative 0.382. That negative is important. And the put is bounded by here 
on the left, negative 1, and on the right, bounded by 0. For similar intuitions, as the stock price here decreases, we're talking about a put now, this put is becoming um, progressively in the money, and the change in the stock price increasingly have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the put option value. So we're approaching here a negative one. On the other hand, as the stock price increases, we are now out of the money on the put. And as we get deeply out of the money, the put option value is not very responsive to changes in the stock price. And so its delta is approaching zero. And for my delta of negative 0.382, I have a similar interpretation, right? It's telling me that if the change in stock price is, let's stick with a positive, let's say it's positive $1, then a delta for this put of negative 0.38 has a simple interpretation. It's telling me that I expect, whoops, I almost wrote a call there, that's a put. It's telling me that we estimate the change in the put price to be negative 38 cents, right? No percentages I'm doing. This delta is an, is an interpretation of a $1 change in the underlying risk factor, the stock price in this case. And then finally, in terms of the spread, uh, spreadsheet, if you download it, I have in the, as the third sheet showing another common plot where what I've changed here, not the y-axis. Here we have the y-axis delta for a call. Here we have y-axis delta for a put. What I've changed here is time to expiration. And then three lines, the blue line here is at the money. So this is for, right, we have a strike price of 100. This is for a stock price of 100. And what this line is showing me is this is the delta for an at the money call option. And it's an increasing function of the time to expiration. If we just run that back in natural time, let's just say we purchased a very long maturity option, a 10-year option, we would be out here, call option at the money, 10 years to expiration, we would be here at the delta. As we march through time and we approach maturity, so the time to expiration decreases, our delta is decreasing. So there's a relationship between delta and time to expiration, but I'm also showing it for out of the money in red and, and in the money in green, and that's for stock prices of plus or minus 30%. I just made those up, show you different relationships. Okay, so that's just in the worksheet, um, and that really concludes my introduction to option delta for the call and the put. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel, and that way you'll get notified, I think, whenever I put up a new video. Thank you.